So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this morning for a discussion on perpetual resources and our ESG performance and goals. I'm Chris Fogg and I lead our investor relations efforts here at Perpetua. Today we have with us Laurel Sayer, President and CEO, McKinsey Lyon, VP of Public Affairs, Alan Haslam, VP of Permitting, and Jessica Largent, CFO. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. And as we go through today's presentation, please note that you can submit questions using the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your screen to submit questions for today's panelists. And first, we'll hear from Laurel. Over to you, Laurel. Thank you, Chris. We released our ninth annual sustainability report last week. Uh, it highlighted our many accomplishments in 2021. We are excited to share some of them with you today. Our goal today is to provide an overview of Perpetua's approach to sustain sustainability and ESG, including why our approach sets us apart in our industry, how our approach creates value and mitigates risk for our stakeholders, and what we believe responsible American mining should look like. We will also touch on how our approach supports our permitting efforts as we advance toward key milestones for our project. Please take a moment to review the cautionary statements and disclaimers on slides two and three. Perpetua's vision is to redevelop and operate one of the highest grade, lowest cost open pit gold mines in the US provide the country with a critical mineral to power batteries that enable the low carbon energy transition and restore an abandoned brownfield site. The Stibnite project will be powered by the lowest carbon emissions grid in the nation. Our ability to source low cost Idaho hydropower combined with a low strip ratio and an antimony byproduct credit of $70 per ounce we are well positioned in the lowest quartile of the global cost curve. Given our low cost, the Stibnite Gold Project has great economics with a 15 year reserve life and a payback period of less than three years. And we have a valuable byproduct in antimony, which is a critical mineral and Perpetua can reestablish the primary production in the US. We will play a key role in the clean energy value chain. Our project, is located in one of the best mining jurisdictions in the world, and we have strong community support. The strong support we have in Idaho has been built over the last decade, as our communities and politicians have seen our commitment to responsible mining and restoration at Stibnite. One of the many reasons we are so unique is because we will take in an area abandoned after 100 years of mining activity most of which was to support World War II and the Korean War, and use a sustainable approach to restore the environment and develop a modern mining project and critical mineral production. Recent geopolitical events have showed us how important it is to secure critical mineral supply chains at home. And Congress clearly agrees on both sides of the aisle. Recently, the House and Senate Armed Services Committees included antimony in reports for the National Defense Authorization Act. And the House requested $10 million in the defense 2023 budget to study secure sourcing of antimony trisulfide. Our goal is to reestablish domestic mining of antimony and support our nation's clean energy and defense goals. And the superior economics and returns of our project means we can fund the restoration of our site and solve environmental issues. Our approach to sustainability is guided by our core values and based on the principles outlined here. Our purpose is to leave the project better than we found it while creating a lasting legacy of economic benefit in the community. We act responsibly in everything we do. We believe this approach will have a positive influence on our long-term financial performance. We value transparency and we provide clear, timely disclosure that allows our stakeholders to better understand and evaluate the outcomes from our proposed project. We incorporate environmental, social, and governance factors in our decision-making, 
because we believe they will ultimately drive our long-term success. We divide responsibilities and decision-making authority as a governance best practice. And we live our values and share our vision to better ourselves and society as a whole. The fact is the world depends on mining and minerals are the first link in the product supply chain. So let's work together to responsibly provide these resources. As I said before, leaving the area better than we found it is a fundamental part of our vision. Perpetual resources restoration and mitigation plans provide early action on water quality and legacy feature cleanup, as well as concurrent restoration and reclamation for any new disturbances. Our project will ultimately improve water quality, restore fish passage that has been blocked for decades, and it will clean up legacy tailings and waste sites. We are confident that the supplemental draft EIS expected in Q3 will demonstrate significant improvement to water temperature and quality, as well as improvements to river habitat and fish migration over existing condi conditions, proving that modern redevelopment can restore conditions at an abandoned mine site. I believe strongly that industry and the environment can and must work together to restore the site. And we are committed to demonstrating to local Idahoans, to our country and the world that responsible American mining is possible. A more sustainable future has been the cornerstone of our company since the beginning and the Stibnite project was built with responsible solutions in mind. We began environmental study and feedback gathering in 2010, long before we submitted our plan of restoration and operations to the US Forest Service in 2016. So in, so in 2014, we published our first annual sustainability report for the 2013 reporting year. And we also completed the installation of a solar panel array to provide power to the camp and buildings on site, reducing our carbon footprint and, and costs. In 2018, we completed our dark skies report to better understand the potential impacts that lighting from the project may have on the species and the habitat, habitats near Stibnite. As a result of that study, Perpetua has designed its mine operation requirements for lighting using dark sky pre best practices to mitigate the impacts to the night sky and the species near the site. We also signed a community agreement in 2018, which established the Stibnite Advisory Council, a way to bring local communities to the table and keep informed on our project developments. We have continuously improved our project since the original plan of restoration and operations and have incorporated feedback from our communities and stakeholders to ultimately deliver an improved plan. We're very excited for the public to see our progress and, the fee and see their feedback addressed with the release of the supplemental draft EIS anticipated next quarter. This will be a significant milestone for Perpetua and we expect the Forest Service will designate a preferred alternative at that time. As our project advances through the final stages of permitting, our ESG capabilities are maturing as well. We enhanced our ESG policy late last year and launched our sustainability roadmap earlier this year to guide us moving forward. We also adopted the SASB reporting framework this year. Our approach to ESG is designed to mitigate risk and preserve value for our stakeholders, and it is working. We recently received our first permit for the project, the Clean Air Act permit to construct. Our performance in 2021 demonstrates our commitment to advancing our ESG goals and our team's ability to deliver those goals. Last week, we adopted an integrated environmental occupational health and safety management system. We delivered significant improvements to the project design currently under regulatory review. We have had no lost time incidents or fatalities and took action to improve water quality by entering into the ASAOC agreement with the EPA and the Department of Agriculture. So looking forward, we are focused on ramping up our sustainability and ESG efforts as our project advances 
and we have already achieved many of our goals only halfway through this year. Now I'll hand it over to McKinsey to discuss our approach to social topics, including stakeholder engagement and our strategic partnerships. Thank you, Laurel. Today, there is strong recognition that domestic mining is the first link to a more secure, sustainable, and ethical supply chain. The question though, from this administration and from many others, is how we can ensure that mining done here at home is done responsibly. And that is a question Perpetua is ready to answer. For us, responsible mining means that the social, economic, and environmental outcomes of the project are just as important as the safe and economic development of the mineral resource. And for Perpetua, we've been putting this into action by providing transparency and accountability to our communities, by listening to all stakeholders and interested parties to find opportunity to adjust our project and collaborate, by ensuring that the economic benefits of the mine are shared with those closest to us. It has also meant prioritizing environmental outcomes, putting our commitment to restore the site into action. It's meant supporting our people through developing a diverse and inclusive team and ensuring our safety culture keeps our people and our communities safe. It's meant becoming a reliable and trusted link in the supply chain for clean energy and national defense needs. And of course, reporting on our goals and the outcomes of our actions. But at the end of the day, it is the simple recognition that doing business the right way, doing right by the environment, by our people and our communities is the right thing to do. And it builds a strong and successful mm -hmm. business. And that's exactly how we've focused our actions. And it is our actions over the last 10 years, along with a clear vision and a plan to restore the site that have helped us develop strong support. Our stakeholders include any person or organization that could be impacted by our, our activities or that has a vested interest in our business. And our goal is to build trust and partnership through transparency and accountability. But even if we don't get all the way to partnership, it is important that our actions confirm the integrity of our word so that over time we build trust. And in order to get there, we've committed ourselves to very meaningful engagement with all of our stakeholders, including those who have questions or concerns about the project. We have an open door so that we can start with listening. And in fact, over the last seven years, Perpetua has hosted over a thousand presentations and community meetings and given over 200 tours of the project site. And in 2020 to 2021, we poured through over 10,000 comments from the public submitted to the permitting agencies. But listening is just the first step. We've also shown our willingness to incorporate that feedback back into our actions and into our mine plan. So over the years, our mine access road, public recreation access solutions, our early fish passage, and now our improved project design were all influenced by community and stakeholder feedback. But you know, please don't take my word for it. Let's pause for a moment. And I'd like to share with you some um, of the views of our neighbors on our engagement. Up here, you can say a lot of things, but your actions have far more weight in them than your words do. We support the community any way we can, you know, and, and all we can really do to build credibility in a community is to do what we say and say what we do. When Perpetua says, this is going to happen, and then it happens, and now it's been years that that has happened, so we've had a, an extensive time frame to really trust what they say. They are listening to the public, to the conservation groups, the recreationalists, the fish folks, the tribes. They are listening. We've went out on tour with the engineers and some of the fish biologists and looked at a different route that would be a win-win, not only for Perpetua, but also the route that we're talking about will beef up the power grid for the city of Yellow Pine and 
all the back country that is tied into that grid. Well, the community feedback has improved our plan. We reduced the project footprint, we lowered the water temperature, and we improved the water quality. The things that I've seen and the way they've done business, they're building trust with the community as they go. So one of the actions that I am most proud of that we've taken as a company is the community agreement that Laurel mentioned that we signed in 2018. It is an agreement with eight local communities that did two things. First, it formalized a monthly forum for representatives of each community to meet directly with company leadership throughout the life of the project. Known as the Stibnight Advisory Council, this group has already met over 30 times. They bring questions from their communities, request technical presentations, and then report back to their constituents. And they also serve as a function to help us identify and address issues before they become problems. So for example, the group is currently discussing how Perpetua can help address traffic and support a local workforce by collaborating on carpooling and pickup locations throughout the region. Or another example, after listening to their communities, the group has also created a citizens independent water monitoring program. The independent water monitoring program is designed to provide awareness and insight into water conditions at the site and assess the validity of Perpetua's reporting. It is a partnership between the Stibnite Advisory Council, the University of Idaho's Water Research Institute, and Perpetua Resources. The program collects and analyzes ground and surface water quality samples from at least 10 different locations throughout the site twice a year. The results of the analysis are then compared with the data collected by Perpetua to give the community members visibility into the accuracy of our data and the analysis performed by the company. Additionally, we knew that it was going to be important for us to address the question of sustained economic benefits for our communities. So in addition to our hiring and contracting local preference, we wanted to make sure that communities would benefit financially even after the mine closes. That is why the second commitment in the community agreement was to establish the Stibnite Foundation, a charitable endowment funded on a profit sharing model with the mine. The foundation is run by representatives of the communities who take in grant applications on an annual basis and work together to fund local charitable needs. For now, we have provided about $300,000 and shares in the company to the foundation, making our communities shareholders as well. And we will make other milestone payments as the project advances. So far, the foundation has provided over $100,000 in charitable giving to organizations in the region, supporting emergency COVID relief in 2020, to school districts, the local hospital, and many more endeavors. And I want to be clear that the foundation and the community agreement are not an impact agreement. Instead, this is the structure by which the company can be accountable to our communities to build systems of communication and solution finding now so that down the road, if we need to mitigate a community impact, we have the trust and the structure in place to do so. Our community engagement also goes beyond the Stibnight Advisory Council and the foundation. In 2021 alone, Perpetua contributed over 1,200 hours, including 187 hours of education outreach. We donated about $50,000 to local charities and organizations and schools, including scholarships for local students, support for STEM education, and even support and partnership to a regional position to help the region address the current housing crunch in Valley County. Responding to local requests, we also extended some of our training on avalanches and Hazwopper to local first responders. So in addition to the on the work ground in our communities, being a responsible community partner also means that we are making decisions on how the products from the Stibnite Gold Project can help advance national and global objectives. So antimony, as Laurel mentioned, is one of the products from our um, project. And I often like to say that it's an unsung hero of the critical mineral world 
because from munitions and primers for the Department of Defense to solar panels and semiconductors in the energy and technology industries, antimony is critical for the economic and national security of our nation and our energy future. The global supply of antimony, however, has been under the control of Chinese interests for well over 100 years. More recently, in the last decade or so, the Chinese government has systematically taken even greater control over the antimony market by purchasing mineral resources and processing facilities around the globe. In fact, in 2021, 90% of the global supply of antimony came from China, Russia, and Tajikistan. And one of the largest economic reserves of antimony, as one of the largest economic reserves of antimony not controlled by the Chinese, our project could supply an average of 35% of US demand in the first six years of the mine, putting us back in control of our supply chain for clean energy, technology, and defense minerals and materials. Strategic partnerships are one way that we can unlock value for our stakeholders and help advance these national and community priorities. That is why in 2021, we entered into a long-term partnership to provide a portion of the antimony from the Stibnite Gold Project to Ambry, an American grid storage battery company. This battery technology is unique. It relies on a simple combination of calcium and antimony. It is scalable up to two gigawatt hours. The batteries are reliable in any environment. They're about 30 to 50% lower cost than lithium ion comparables in 2020 to 2023. They have a 20 year lifespan, double those comparables in the market. And Ambry is committed to US manufacturing, which they just announced that they are tripling their US manufacturing footprint. So with our current agreement, our antimony will power approximately 13 gigawatt hours of stored solar energy on a daily cycle for 20 years. This partnership shows that modern responsible mining can play in the energy future, in the clean energy future. And we are prioritizing our product to make that a reality. But now I will turn it over to Alan to discuss the permitting process for our project and the role ESG plays in supporting his team's efforts. All right, thanks for Kinsey. Um, as Laura mentioned earlier, we began our environmental study work and feedback gathering back in 2010. In 2016, we submitted our plan of operations, our plan of restoration and operations, or our PRO, to the Forest Service, uh, which kicked off five plus years of regulatory review under the NEPA process. We continued to gather feedback and submitted a modified PRO in 2019. Then in August of 2020, the Forest Service released their draft environmental impact statement with a 75 day public comment period. During that comment period, they received about 10,000 letters from the public and roughly 85% of those were positive. Perpetual Resources listened and acted upon that feedback, both positive and negative, and incorporated a number of suggestions into a second modified proposed action, also known as the Mod Pro 2, which we submitted to the Forest Service in December of 2020. Those modifications were designed to uh, reduce the project footprint and improve overall environmental outcomes. The Forest Service reviewed our modified proposed plan and the remainder of the, the NEPA process is focused on our modified proposed plan with two identified access route alternatives that the Forest Service will carry forward after they've eliminated um, two other alternatives uh, from further consider consideration. Uh, as McKinsey mentioned, stakeholder feedback is important to the success of our project and particularly for the permitting process. While the process does take a long time, rest assured it is a top priority for us and we're making sure no stone is left unturned as we support the Forest Service and cooperating agencies in conducting their administrative uh, review. The NEPA process is designed to be iterative. Um, it uses data, scientific analysis, and public feedback to ultimately reduce potential impacts to the environment. In fact, the 2020 comment period helped identify opportunities 
to improve environmental outcomes, such as reducing the project footprint, including total mine volume reduced by 10%, including a 70% reduction in the hangar flats pit, a total pit disturbance reduction of 7%, eliminating the fiddle rock storage area to reduce disturbance by 168 acres. We also um, complete, completely backfilled the hangar flats pit in the Mod Pro 2 um, and commitment to install geosynthetic liners on the yellow pine pit backfill and the hangar flats pit backfill, as well as cover the entire tailing storage uh, facility and the TSF buttress. This will all improve overall project water quality. And um, we also improved water temperature through replacing the existing pit lake and improved shading over, over streams. We delivered these concepts in our Mod Pro 2 to the Forest Service in response to comments on the draft EIS and included them in our 2020 feasibility study. Right now, the Forest Service is focused on our Mod Pro 2 plan with, two, with, with those two potential access routes. We anticipate the Forest Service will issue a supplemental draft EIS in Q3, including the selection of a preferred alternative. We have a clear, well-defined path towards a record of decision focused on evaluating our plan. The supplemental draft EIS will provide the public and cooperating agencies the opportunity to review our improved plan in order to ensure a full analysis of the refined project. I'm confident that the additional evaluation contained within the, the supplemental will directly address issues raised in the 2020 draft um, EIS comment period. It's also important to note that in parallel with the NEPA process, we're also advancing many local, state, and federal ancillary permits. And I'm happy to report that we received our first permit, the air permit to construct earlier this month. Now I'll turn it over to, uh, to Jess to cover our approach to governments. Thanks, Alan. Our approach to governance is focused on mitigating risk and providing a foundation to support long-term value creation. As a publicly traded company, we are dedicated to the highest standards and have robust policies in place. Corporate governance begins with our board of directors who provide oversight of our risks and help guide the strategic direction of the company. Perpetua's full board is engaged in oversight of specific ESG topics, including stakeholder engagement, enterprise risk management, cybersecurity, sustainability policies, government relations, and emergency planning and response. The board also delegates certain risk oversight to their four committees, the audit, compensation, corporate governance and nominating, and the technical committee. Those four committees are focused on the ESG topics highlighted on the right hand side of this slide. As Laurel mentioned earlier, we continue to ramp up our ESG efforts and capabilities as our project advances through permitting. This time for the first year, our sustainability report was aligned with SASB reporting framework for the metals and mining industry. We were proud to join other industry leaders to ensure the ESG issues most relevant to our business are clearly reported under a widely entrusted framework. That framework, together with our guiding ESG principles and discussions with our management team and board, determined our material topics for 2021. We also compared our business and the risks most relevant to Perpetua to our peers. As we move towards project development, the factors most material may change, but we will continue to use a holistic approach focused on the areas that have the greatest potential impact to our business and our stakeholders. This slide includes a snapshot of our material topics for 2021 and detailed reporting on each topic can be found in our sustainability report. Underpinning our strong governance is a deep bench of experienced leaders and advisors. Our management team has the experience, the passion, and the relationships necessary to deliver on our goals. And more than 80% of our broader team is based in Idaho with deep roots connected to Valley County and our surrounding communities. 
And as you can see here, our board is a diverse group of experienced leaders with unique skill sets, which are valuable not only today, but will be valuable as we advance our project through the next phases. We at Perpetua continuously review the composition of our board, management team, and workforce to ensure we have the right people in the right positions based on the stage of our project and the goals we have established. So with that, I'll pass back to Laurel for the wrap up. Thanks, Jess. Perpetua continues to be significantly undervalued relative to our peer group, despite our experienced team, recent achievements, and near-term catalysts. I believe this represents an attractive entry point for new investors. We expect a significant re-rating to occur as we advance through the permitting process. But I also believe there is an opportunity today to share our investment thesis with a broader investor group who recognize the strategic value of our asset for its antimony and who value companies with strong ESG principles that are foundational to their business plans. So wrapping up, Perpetua Resource is unique because we bring solutions. We have a large, low-cost, high-grade open pit gold mine. We will offer the only domestic mined source of the critical mineral antimony. And we will use mine development to fund restoration at an abandoned mine site. So thank you. And now we will open up for questions. Thanks, Laurel, and thank you to the rest of our panelists as well. As a reminder to our audience, you can submit any questions that you have through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And I'll just give it a minute here and check to see what questions we have coming through. Uh, this first question might be a good one actually for you, Laurel. Um, can you provide more details around the, the support in Washington on both sides of the aisle that you mentioned, and specifically how your approach to ESG has helped gain political support for the project? Sure. We've seen, we've seen some momentum in Washington. Um, it's really picked up recently as a result of, of growing demand for clean energy and to shore up our national defense critical mineral stockpiles. For example, um, June 8th of this year, the House Armed Services Committee's NDAA report cited concern that Chinese and Russian geopolitical dynamics could accelerate supply chain disruptions, particularly with antimony. Therefore, and that directs the manager of the National Defense Stockpile at the Defense Logistics Agency to brief the committee on the status of the antimony stockpile and provide a five-year outlook on current and future supply chain vulnerabilities. Then in June, on June 14th of this year, Senators Manchin and Ernst released a homeland acceleration of a recovering, of recovering deposits and renewing onshore critical keystones act, the Hard Rock Act. On June 15th, the House Defense Appropriations Subcommittee included $10 million in its bill for the Army to study the domestic sourcing and production of military-grade antimony trisulfide. It's for tank and for medium uh, caliber ammunition. On June 16th, the Senate Armed Services Committee's NDAA also included a briefing requirement on antimony from DLA, the Defense Logistics Agency. Both the House and the Senate, they'll move the NDAA through the legislative process, and both chambers are expected to vote on the bill later this year. So also on the 16th of June, the Senate NDAA also included $1 billion in funding for DLA to support the acquisition of critical defense materials like antimony for the national defense stockpile. So politicians, they're important for stakeholders, for us, and we've been very proactive in engaging with re representatives across different agencies on both sides of the aisle to educate them on all aspects of our project in alignment with our ESG principles and the values of transparency and accountability. So earlier this year, I had the opportunity to travel to Washington, and I'm happy to report that antimony it is front and center 
on many radars in our capital. Thanks, Laurel. Next question we have here is, are there opportunities to make an end-to-end -end supply chain built in America, given your partnerships with Ambry and U.S. Antimony? That might be a good one for uh, you, McKinsey. Thanks, and that's, um, that's a great question. And we've taken that first step, right? The agreement with Ambry is that first step for us to be able to start that American domiciled supply chain. That missing component right now is, or not missing, but that next step would then be processing. And, and I can say that we would be very happy to play a role in a complete American supply chain from mine to battery. And so we're exploring a number of processing options for our mined antimony, whether it's antimony metal or antimony trisulfide. And there are domestic facilities as well as others in North America and across the globe. And in addition to that, it's also really encouraging to see the Department of Energy under the leadership of Secretary Granholm begin to direct resources to bring critical mineral processing back to America. And that's, that's really an important step in shoring up these supply chains, but we have to have American mining first. Thanks, Mackenzie. And um, a related question just came in. Do you have any sales contracts yet um, and or do you know when you anticipate securing any? Uh, maybe a good one for Jess. Sure, yeah, tagging on to what Mackenzie was just talking about. So we do have a, an antimony supply agreement with Ambry. It's for a portion of our antimony production. Um, it was not an offtake agreement. There was no financing involved in that. It was just truly future supply agreement of our antimony. So they will be um, a, a large customer of ours. And then we, we did strategically leave, it was only a percentage and we strategically left some on the table for other customers as both Laurel and Mackenzie have talked to, um, you know, antimony trisulfide is needed in our munitions and tanks and military gear as flame retardants. So there's a lot of other end uses as well. Um, although we are quite excited about the new battery technology that Ambry is advancing. So, Yes, we've got a supply agreement, but it's not for 100% of our production. Great, thank you. And this next one looks like a good, good one for Alan. Um, can you explain or, or clarify why you need to go through uh, the, the supplemental EIS process again, given you already went through um, the 2020 process? All right, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, the, the, the US permitting process prioritizes scientific review and public transparency. And I can tell you that the process has for sure um, made our project better through that feedback and, and it allows the public full insight into the outcomes of our project. The supplemental draft uh, will review the project updates that we made in response to public an agency comments on the 2020 draft EIS. And while these project changes could have been incorporated directly into a final uh, EIS, the Forest Service believed that additional scientific review by the agencies, along with another opportunity for the public to review, would certainly strengthen the administrative record on the, on the project. So uh, Perpetual feels uh, very confident that the process we've gone through meets and exceeds the intention of that NEPA process. Great, thank you. And, and another related, somewhat related question on permitting. Uh, congratulations on receiving your first permit, the air permit. Uh, what did that process tell you about the potential success or challenges uh, of the other permits remaining? All right, thanks, Chris. Um, we're, we're definitely thrilled to have uh, received approval for our air permit from uh, Idaho Department of Environmental Quality. The, the process took about three years of engagement with the agency and the public. But what it signals to us is that our diligent approach of working with stakeholders and the agencies to address questions and concerns and ultimately find solutions, uh, it, it works to bring about ultimate approval. 
Um, it's also a recognition that this project can meet state and federal standards, which is a positive signal for those permits down the road. Great, thanks, Alan. And with that, it looks like uh, there are no remaining questions left, so we'll close there. Thank you again to our panelists and to our audience for attending today. A replay of today's webinar along with the presentation will be posted to our website, uh, perpetualresources.com, shortly after the event this morning. Thanks all, take care.